Good morning. I'm Councilmember Donovan Richards from the 31st District in Queens, and I'm the chair of the Public Safety Committee. I'm joined by Council Members Diana Ayala, chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, and Council Member Joseph Borelli, chairman of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. We are also joined by Council Members Holden, Lanceman, Brannon, Lanceman, I said, Gibson, and Levine. We're here today, today to confront a difficult subject matter. The city is confronting a crisis in mental health services, and we have seen that the police department is not immune to that fact. This year alone, nine active police officers who have died from suicide and at least two other retired officers. I want to begin by reading the names of those officers we've lost to suicide this year, followed by a moment of silence to honor them. Officer Robert Echevera, Officer Jason Goldberg, Officer Johnny Rios, Deputy Chief Stephen Silks, Detective Joseph Calabres, Officer Michael Caddy, Officer Minkarani, Officer Kevin Price, Sergeant Terrence McAvey, Retired Sergeant Jose, Jose Pabon, Retired Sergeant Edward Rosa. I also want to acknowledge the tragic deaths of two other members of the department that occurred this week. School safety agent Nair McMormick and Inspector Michael McGrath. I'm gonna ask everybody to stand and let's just have a moment of silence for them. Thank you, may be seated. I personally saw the immediate pain these tragedies caused when I came upon the home of one of the most recent officers around the corner from my own home a few weeks ago. I was with the family of Officer Echevera and spent time with his fellow officers in the hospital struggling to cope with the sorrow of losing one of their own. Until 2019, it was not unusual in a given year to see four or five officers lost to suicide. But when we see that we have twice that number already this year, it tells us that there is an urgent need to do more for, fan or to, for officers in need of help. The truth is four or five is four or five too many and that this hearing is long overdue. We need to get to the heart of this problem and get right to finding a solution. I am proud to say that the department has been eager to partner with us to find a path forward. We've had very productive conversations with several of the NYPD witnesses before me today, and I know they are as committed as we are to getting this right. They understand better than I do that there are certain challenges in being a first responder. They are exposed to some of the hardest situations New Yorkers face. Think about this. You call 911 when there's an emergency, when there's something wrong. People call 911 when they are in danger, when they are in crisis, when they are dying, when they have nobody else to turn to. And first responders have to not just see these situations, they have to try to fix the problem. They have to live that trauma with every person they help, from victims of gun violence to the homeless, to domestic violence situations, as we saw earlier this morning when an officer was shot in Staten Island helping a domestic violence survivor. Thankfully, it sounds like this officer will make a full recovery. Dealing with traumatic situations is an officer's day job. And that trauma comes on top of the daily stresses that we all face. So the fact that some of them are struggling to cope with trauma should not be a surprise to anyone. And there is no shame in that struggle. If there's a single message that I want to deliver today, which gets to the heart of why we're here discussing this painful subject, as well as the legislation that we're hearing, it's this. 
to all of the department officers who are out there and who are struggling. There is someone who can help you. It may seem hopeless at times, but there is a path forward despite how hard it is to see sometimes. This hearing is about giving you the safe space you need to deal with whatever you're going through, whether that's within the department, through peer groups, through medical care. We are here to offer you help and to say that there is absolutely nothing wrong with asking for help. And this is not just about suicide. I'm sure there are many officers who are just burying their frustrations and their stress, and that can affect every part of someone's life. When we as a city have asked you to take on our greatest challenges, we need to do more to make sure you have what you need to cope with yours. That's why we're here intro introducing introduction number 1704, a local law requiring the department to provide mental health information, training, and support services to officers, sponsored by Councilmember Levine, which he will talk about in more detail later. I'm co-sponsoring this bill, and I want to give my legislative director, Jordan Gibbons, a lot of credit for working with Councilmember Levine's office on getting this bill done. He and I have been working hard on this issue for a long time, and I'm proud to support this bill with Councilmember Levine. I'm looking forward to a discussion with some of the esteemed members of the department on the efforts made by the NYPD thus far and how we can continue to work together to support the officers who've dedicated their lives to serving our city. I'll now turn it over to Chair Ayala, then Borelli, and then Levine for remarks. I also want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Members Powers, uh, Valone, and Cabrera as well, and Rodriguez as well. Uh, I'll go to Council Member Chair Ayala for uh, uh, opening statement. Thank you, Chair Richards. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. I would like to thank Chair Donovan Richards and Chair Joseph Borelli for holding this important hearing with me today. We are holding this hearing today to discuss a very serious topic, preventing suicide and promoting mental health for first responders. As everyone knows, New York City has lost 11 officers to suicide this year. Before 2019, NYPD has seen a consistently low rate of officer suicides, but we still lost four to five officers to suicide each year for the last five years. Nationally, the suicide rate for officers is nearly four times the rate of the general public. First responders of all kinds, including officers, firefighters, and emergency medical personnel, are generally more likely to die from suicide than in the line of duty. First responders are far greater, at far greater risk than the general population for depression, anxiety-related mental health conditions, burnout, substance use disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, some studies uh, show that nearly one-fifth of police officers in the United States suffers from P uh, PTSD, and up to one-third suffer from symptoms associated with PTSD but do not meet the full diagnosis. Further research shows that the occupational stress of police work is directly related to higher rates of heart disease, divorce, and acute stress disorder. These statistics and figures are alarming, but they do not make us feel collectively ashamed or embarrassed. They should remind us of the acute and significant dangers that first responders face every day. Every day, first responders put their lives on the line and put themselves at risk for bodily and mental harm. The danger that first responders face and run towards every day affect them physically, mentally, emotionally, and psychologically through no fault of their own just as they would any other human being facing similar daily traumas. This summer, my district experienced an increase in shooting all around the same neighborhood. I witnessed the collective trauma, fear, confusion, and sadness that my neighbors experienced as a result of these shootings. And I was reminded of the importance of processing and seeking mental health resources when a traumatic event is witnessed or lived through. These are exactly the kinds of traumatic events that first responders respond to, witness, experience, and experience every single day. To be affected by these events mentally is a natural human response. Mental illness affects all of us, and it does not imply weakness. In fact, seeking mental health help is a sign of tremendous bravery and inner strength. Seeking help for mental illness should not stigmatize. It should be celebrated. When we seek help and address these issues directly as a community, we send a message to those in crisis or to those experiencing suicidality that they are not alone. 
that hope is not lost and that they are here for, that we are here for them and they have their backs. To the first responders of New York City, you are not alone. We have your back and we are here for you. We are holding this hearing to understand this issue more clearly, to learn about the resources that you're receiving and those that you still need and to demonstrate our support. I wanna thank the administration for the commitment that they have made to bringing more mental health resources to first responders and I look forward to hearing more about all of the work that we're doing and the role of the city council can play. I also wanna thank my committee staff, Council Sarah Liss, Policy Analyst Chrissy Dwyer, my Chief of Staff Luisa Lopez, and my Deputy Chief of Staff Bianca Almedina for making this hearing possible. I now turn over to Chair Borelli for his opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Ayala, and thank you to Chair Donovan Richards and, of course, Chair Mark Levine for uh, convening this hearing that, uh, as we all know, is, is somewhat overdue. Um, since 2017, there were and there have been nine uh, taxi driver suicides uh, in our city. And we saw in the wake of that tragedy and those horrible deaths an acknowledgement that perhaps some of the things that we do here in City Hall may contribute to those things. I'm not an expert. I don't know the rationale. I don't pretend to know the rationale of people who make these decisions. But it was clear. Uh, whether you read media reports or heard the testimony from the administration, that perhaps some of the things that we did led to those deaths. Um, taxi drivers were killing themselves at a rate of 4.5 per 100,000. The NYPD statistic is much higher. It's 25 deaths per 100,000. That's five times higher than the TLC. I'm hoping that so that we're not treating this like just a rubber stamp committee uh, that uh, we're, we're, there's no topics that are off the table, that we acknowledge that perhaps some of the rhetoric and some of the policies that uh, we at times make could lead to higher stress and higher pressures and higher demand uh, on the work uh, of people who already have high stress, high demand, uh, and high intensity jobs. So I, I commend uh, all three chairs for hosting this hearing uh, and um, I mean frankly this is an issue that I don't think we're ever going to get we're going we're to pinpoint why these things happen uh, but if we can make some headway uh, and we can get some progress uh, and we can get some policy and programs designed to help people and to remove the stigma of seeking mental health treatment uh, then that's something I hope we can all get behind. Thank you. Thank you. All right, first we'll be hearing uh, from the first, oh, we're gonna go to Councilmember Mark Levine uh, for the statement. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Richards, Chair Ayala, Chair Borelli, and thank you for eloquently stating the degree to which the members of the NYPD family are exposed continually to traumatic and intensely stressful conditions in a way that virtually no other profession is. That is why uh, tragically, the rates of suicide in the department are estimated to be four times as high as it's for the general population. And we owe it to the people of this department to adequately serve them under these conditions. Our understanding today is that the total number of full-time mental health clinicians on staff in a department which has 55,000 staff overall and almost 40,000 uniform staff. The total number of clinicians ready to serve the mental health needs of these men and women today is four. And that means that the vast majority of members of the department under most circumstances will never meet with one of those clinicians. And it only makes it that much more likely that they will suffer in silence until their crisis escalates. And so I am very pleased to be uh, introducing a bill here together with my co-sponsor, Chair Richards, intro 1704, which would ensure that the department has adequate staffing of clinicians to a degree that allows them to be present in the commands, in the precincts, in a way that frankly makes it normal to help remove the stigma the same way it's normal to see a doctor for an annual physical, for physical ailments. It should be normal for members of the department who wish to see a professional for mental health services. And so our bill 
calls for adequate staffing to make that possible. It calls for the provision of voluntary annual consultations, the same way people can seek an annual physical. And it calls for information and training in person and online to give people the resources they need, the resources they need to access help in the department and outside the department. And we are ever mindful of the need to protect members of the department who are fearful that this could harm their career prospects, that being honest about their problems could lead to their badge and gun being taken away. And we want to provide these services in a way that are confidential and to offer people the option to seek help outside the department in a way that they are confident will not compromise their position within the department. That's our goal here today. And I'm very, very uh, grateful for the partnership of the PD leadership in this and the rank and file as well, and look forward to this important discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Levine. We're also joined by Councilmember Mizell as well. All right, we're gonna go to the first panel. We're joined by Assistant Chief Ma Matthew Pontillo, First Deputy Commissioner Benjamin Tucker from the NYPD, David Schmerler, Director of FDNY CSU, Assistant Deputy Commissioner Oleg, Dr. Myla Harrison, Department of Health, and Captain Frank Lido, uh, Dir Deputy Director of FDNY. Uh, we're gonna ask everybody, of course, I'm gonna have uh, Dance Where You In, and then we'll ask everybody to make sure you say, state your name on the record as well in your possession. Thank you. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and answer all questions to the best of your ability? All righty, you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Richards, Chair Borelli, uh, Chair Ayala, and the members of the council. I'm Ben Tucker, the department's first deputy commissioner, and I'm joined by, as you already heard, uh, Assistant Chief Matthew Pontillo, who's a commanding officer of my office, as well as Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters, Oleg Chernovsky. On behalf of Police Commissioner James O'Neill, we are pleased to offer testimony about the issue that is very personal to us and to every member of the NYPD, the issue of mental health crisis, the, the mental health crisis facing uh, the department. While it is routine for the department to appear before the council to account for how the 55,000 members of the department help others, I wanna, take, uh, wanna thank this body for convening this forum to highlight the crisis we are facing and acknowledging the urgency uh, of finding ways we can help our officers and offer them resources to help themselves. At the outset, I wanna make clear to every active duty and retired police officer, as well as our civilian members of the service, that you are indeed not, uh, that you not suffer in silence and you are never, never alone. Help is always available whenever and wherever you need it. So please reach out. Our officers are no less immune from the myriad challenges and stresses many people experience in both their personal and professional lives. However, unlike most professions, as, as was heard in the opening statements by our chairs, uh, police officers, as well as other first responders, are required to involve themselves in what are often unpredictable and intense situations when they respond to emergency calls perform their patrol duties and investigate the horrific crimes that are often occur in our city. Imagine coming to work and routinely responding to and investigating domestic violence, such as the incident this morning that was referenced, uh, child abuse or explo exploitation, violent rapes or murders. These experiences and others, uh, these images uh, the images they Im embed in our minds uh, simply don't go away at the end of the tour. The fear of uh, a victim or a helplessness uh, and innocence of a child can take their toll. And there's no question that the culture of antagonism and disrespect toward our officers that we've seen recently and witnessed in the streets and on social media are powerful emotional uh, stresses for our officers. Unfortunately, it is nothing new, um, but it can have a cumulative effect. 
The stress of the job coupled with the personal stresses of life weigh heavily and continuously on the minds of our officers. As you well know, we have seen a significant increase in the number of NYPD officers taking their own lives this year. There have been nine, as has been mentioned, such tragedies to date, seven since June. In response, Commissioner O'Neill declared a mental health crisis in June and uh, charged me with impaneling a task force that immediately began uh, to implement short-term solutions and to develop long-term strategies to assist our officers. Death by suicide is, is not new to law enforcement, to the law enforcement community. In a typical year, we may see four or five of such tragic incidents in our city, but recent years have shown an upward trend. The risk of suicide for first responders is higher than the general population, and police officer suicides now outnumber line of duty death fatalities nationwide. The department has put in place response protocols to these strategies, to these tragedies, and has a number of services available to our officers and is seeking to establish additional services and programs. We recognize and appreciate the aims of intro 1704, which seeks to address and fund the services we have begun to and intend to put into place. I want to thank Council Members Levine and Richards uh, for meeting with us and all the uh, bill sponsors uh, for standing with us at this difficult time. Our Force Investigation Division investigates each death by suicide as well as all firearm discharges. And we conduct psychological autopsies to help us gain further insight into what led to these events and to learn what we can do to prevent future suicides. The department employs postvention techniques to address any post-suicide contagion, uh, contagion effects which might lead to other suicide attempts in the immediate aftermath of an officer taking his or her own life. For some time now, the department has taken affirmative steps to offer assistance to officers in need. Uh, uh, our Employee Assistance Unit, uh, the EAU, offers access to peer counselors who are both uniformed and civilian active members of the service in a variety of ranks and titles. It also provides access to clinicians and social workers on a referral basis. The EAU members are available around the clock and are frequently deployed to assist officers at critical incidents, including officer suicide, by, ben, uh, by lending counsel uh, to the responding officers as well. EAU staff then make the following visits, uh, follow-up visits to the, uh, to the affected commands to assess any lasting trauma uh, from the events that uh, impacted their officers. The primary role of peer counselors is to listen and refer. The peer counselor will lend a sympathetic ear in a private and confidential environment. Having a peer uh, validate one's concerns by taking the time to listen is an important and critical first step. Often, this is all that, it, that is needed, but under, circumstan under circumstances where more must be done, the peer counselor can provide the officer with inf information materials and referrals to mental health professionals or other supportive outlets. Information on these resources is available in every command, posted on the NYPD intranet, and is retrievable through an app on the department-issued smartphones. The NYPD Chaplain's Unit provides members of the service of all faiths with access to confidential counseling, spiritual assistance, or moral guidance from faith leaders of various faiths. This tradition dates back over 100 years and is a steadfast and enduring pillar uh, of the department's commitment to, well, to the well-being of our officers. And lastly, the police organization providing peer assistance, or PAPA organization, is an independent volunteer police support network. It provides a confidential, safe, supportive environment for officers and retirees alike. Papa's services of intervention, prevention, self-care, and resilience are now provided by volunteer, a volunteer network of approximately 280 active and retired uniform members uh, serving uh, as, su as uh, support, uh, peer support officers. Papa also maintains a network of 120 clinicians skilled at working with officers referred by Papa volunteers 
At any given time, about 25 officers in crisis situations are receiving support uh, from PAPA's clinician referral network. Operating 24 hours a day, every day of the year, PAPA assists officers in coping with personal life stresses and stress related to the law enforcement profession. PAPA has a specific focus on preventing and reducing post-traumatic stress, marital problems, substance abuse, and suicide. PAPA, the PAPA network reduces the gap between essential support services and officers' access to these services. Now, with all of that, there's still yet much more to be done. Uh, the department is in the process of augmenting these programs and implementing new programs and initiatives. As with many challenges, listening, collecting uh, relevant information and effectively disseminating uh, information is key. And to that end, the department has partnered with Thrive New York City, or NYC, to provide evidence-based training for members of the service in all ranks. At the, at the executive level, we have completed a new executive health and wellness training program over the past several weeks to ensure that every executive understands how critical their leadership will be as we move ahead with the reform efforts. All captains and above, roughly 800 people, as well as the civilian executives, took part in a three-hour training last month. The training focused on suicide as a health issue uh, stress, mental health as it relates to the police culture as well. It covered what the department leadership can do to support officer wellness, providing executives with an, uh, updated information on internal and external resources for those in, the, in their charge. Leadership must set the tone, and it is not only okay, but essential to seek help. This training is an important first step in raising awareness among executive leaders. At the borough level, every patrol borough is sending officers from each precinct to, to an eight-hour mental health first aid training uh, that is conducted and supported by uh, Thrive New York City um, with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We have completed seven sessions with almost 200 officers trained so far. This training will continue indefinitely the officers trained thus far in addition to, are in addition to the roughly 8,000 members of the service, including school safety agents, 911 call takers, and traffic enforcement agents who have already received this training as part of an on the ongoing uh, mental health first aid training program, which began um, by Thrive NYC in 2016. At the command level, we are collaborating with Thrive, Thrive New York, NYC's uh, New York NYC Well Initiative uh, to provide training sessions for all personnel in the field at every precinct, police service area, and transit district. This training covers risk factors and warning signs, how to talk to someone uh, who may be in crisis, and where to go for help. We've also mandated that all officers take the online shield of resistance training offered by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, a division within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This training provides coping mechanisms for officers confronting stress in their personal and professional lives. And over 24,000 officers um, have completed uh, this training to date. Looking beyond the expansion of training on mental health issues, the department has important structural changes that are also underway. Now, we, are, we are establishing a new health and wellness section and have established it within the Office of the Deputy Commissioner for Employee Relations. This new section will encompass a peer support unit, a, a wellness outreach unit, and it will include the already existing uh, employee assistance unit. The peer support unit is an expansion and a reimagination of the existing peer counseling model that I mentioned previously. With the expansion, peer support officers will be embedded in each command and will eventually number 400, between 400 and 600 volunteers. The volunteers' responsibilities will be to ask, listen, and encourage. Ask the officer about his or her struggles, listen to what they have to say, and encourage them to have faith in themselves and to seek help if needed. Training of the new peer support officers is currently underway. The 
The Wellness Outreach Unit is modeled on the success of the LAPD program. It will provide officers with the highest level of targeted intervention available within the department. The unit will deploy wellness outreach teams consisting of, psycho of a psychologist, social worker, and a liaison from the employee assistance unit. After the complete rollout, uh, the unit will consist of approximately 58 teams or one team per 1,000 members of the service. Teams will regularly visit each command to establish familiarity and build uh, rapport with members of the command and will proactively reach out to members of the service to offer services. And lastly, the department uh, has begun the process of reviving Project COPE, an initiative started in the wake of 9-11. Back then, the department partnered with a private hospital to provide counseling sessions with private clinicians and a 24-hour hotline without charge to the officers coping with the trauma from the attacks. We are in the process of currently uh, expedited, uh, an expedited procurement to establish such a service again uh, with, full, um, RF, with a full RFP to follow uh, after about 18 months, Matt? Uh, we look forward to, to working with the Council to continue to find creative solutions to stem the tide of this crisis. The Department has a solemn duty to do everything in its power to support our officers, well-being, and to build a comprehensive support infrastructure that provides them with a catalog of resources to choose from uh, to meet their individual and unique needs. As been, has been said already, uh, we must ensure that every officer knows the department will be there for them in their time of need, just as our officers are there for New Yorkers in, in, the times, in their times of need. Officers respond every day to the call of duty. Now it's our turn as a department and as a city uh, to fulfill the, our, our obligations to do the same for them. It is literally a matter of life and death. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, on, uh, on this critical issue, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Tucker will go to the Department of Health or FDNY. Good afternoon, Chair Borelli, Chair Richards, and Chair Ayala, and all of the Council members present. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on the topic of preventing suicide and promoting mental health for first responders. My name is Dr. David Schmerler, and I am the director of the FDNY Counseling Service Unit. I am joined today by Captain Frank Lido, deputy director of the Counseling Service Unit. At the fire department, the mental health of our members is of utmost importance. My background is as a civilian psychologist, and Captain Lido is a fire officer with over 36 years of experience with FDNY. We know that while our members are highly trained to respond to the most dangerous situations that arise, they are still human. Issues such as anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, job-related stress, family or emotional issues, or substance abuse can impact their ability to perform their duties. We have very strong internal support systems among our informed, uniformed ranks, but there are times when our members need assistance from li licensed mental health providers healthcare professionals, and our certified peer support personnel. We know that it is critically important that the department provide avenues for our members to seek that assistance and that they are able to do so without feeling stigmatized or feeling the need to hide that they are in need of some support. The Counseling Service Unit, CSU, was established to provide resources for FDNY members and their families. We are proud of the work that our staff and volunteers perform. Every day, the New York City Fire Department is involved with traumatic incidents. The CSU has been in operation for over 30 years and, in that time, has become the gold standard for providing mental health services for first responders. In addition to serving our own members, we frequently dispatch staff, when requested, to traumatic events around the country to provide support for our fellow first responder agencies and members of the public. Recent prominent examples of this include the Oakland ghost ship fire that killed 36 civilians, the school shooting in Parkland, Florida, and the mass shooting at a country music concert in Las Vegas. In addition to providing direct services, we work with other fire departments to strengthen their own mental health 
and behavioral health programs, and many have patterned their program after ours. The CSU has offices in five locations, Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island, Long Island, and Orange County. Our resources are available to all uniform and civilian employees of the fire department and their families 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they are free and completely confidential. Services are provided on site, and we also provide referrals to other providers when appropriate. Our professional staff includes 25 full-time and six part-time licensed counselors, including social workers, licensed mental health counselors, a licensed creative art therapist, and for World Trade Center issues, psychiatrists, nurses, and nurse practitioners. We also have roughly 60 to 80 uniform members of our peer support team. We work closely with our unions as we realize that strengthening those partnerships leads to best practices that benefit our members. Generally, we perform three types of outreach. We make routine visits to firehouses and EMS stations. We visit work locations when requested by an officer, and we respond proactively to major events. During our visits to firehouses and EMS stations, we speak to members about what services are available from CSU. When we respond to the scene of major events, we provide both immediate and long-term outreach, as sometimes trauma is not initially revealed in the immediate aftermath of an incident. Some examples of incidents to which we send members include a line of duty death or serious injury, a serious vehicular accident or a mass casualty incident, a pediatric event, a terrorist threat, and shootings. We send our teams to visit the incident scene, members at the hospital, the firehouse and EMS stations where members serve, and we conduct follow-up visits in the ensuing days and weeks. In addition to job-related stress, we also provide support to members and their families dealing with non-job-related incidents and issues. These include issues such as an illness or a death in the family, marital issues, mental health problems, family member substance abuse, and other personal problems. We have a 24-hour hotline that is staffed by our certified peer support personnel. We also offer a wellness program that includes yoga. We work closely with other programs within the fire department, such as the Family Assistance Unit, to offer services to the family of deceased members and to promote CSU services. A major focus of the CSU is working to destigmatize the use of support services. We give presentations at the Fire Academy and the EMS Academy to new firefighters and EMTs and to officers when they are training for new roles. We provide information to members when they receive their annual medical evaluations and we publish information on the fire department's internal communication and training platform, Diamond Plate. The Counseling Service Unit has evolved over time to fit the changing needs of our members. The World Trade Center attack created such a great demand that it generated innovation in the services and the tactics that CSU employs. We found that members helping members was especially effective, so we enhanced our peer support program. We learned that members were having trouble, especially during off hours, so we created our 24-hour hotline. We found that conducting regular check-ins produced better results than stationing staff inside houses for long periods of time and adjusted our practices accordingly. We are pleased with the prog progress that we have made, but we are also in a constant state of exploring new ideas about how to provide the services that we, uh, how to improve the services that we provide. Currently, we are undertaking an opioid awareness campaign, visiting roughly half a dozen firehouses a day to discuss the dangers of opioid addiction and provide resources for members and their families who are dealing with what has become a widespread problem. We are also working with the Mayor's Thrive NYC program to develop and participate in mental health first aid, which is an evidence-based program designed to educate civilians in recognizing mental health and substance abuse issues. To date, more than 350 members of FDNY staff have been trained in mental health first aid. The fire department's most important asset is our members, and we know the importance of, sur of supporting them not only with physical training and equipment, but also with resources that enable them to deal with the trauma that they are exposed to on a regular basis. We have a strong program. 
We believe that it is the strongest in the country, but we will continue to for looking for ways to enhance it to better serve our members. Talking about these issues and the importance of seeking assistance, including through public discussions like the one we are having here today, helps to remove the stigma and encourage first responders to seek help when they need it. I thank the Council for the opportunity to engage in this important discussion. I'd be happy to take questions at this time. Thank you so much, and we're also joined by Councilmember Cohen. All right, let's uh, end also Deutsch and Meisel. Um, okay, let's hop into some quick questions. Um, can you talk about some of the challenges, and this is for the NYPD, you see in terms of getting officers to seek help uh, when they need it? I'll start off, but I, then I'll ask uh, Chief Fontello to jump in. Uh, but, but, you know, the challenge is it's the whole issue around stigma. Part of the challenges grow out of the myths about or misunderstanding of what the processes are when our medical division is involved. Um, and so the notion that a police officer, for example, would have his or her guns taken away and their shield taken away um, is, you know, if you're a cop, uh, uh, it is part of your identity. I mean, I've been in this business 50 years and, and you know, while I, I, I carry a shield still, I, I don't, I could carry a gun, but I don't. But uh, it's not who I am, but, but, but I think on our, when you're in active duty, uh, you, you carry your weapons all the time, on duty and off duty, and so that's part of who you are. And that, you know, if you're taking them away, um, the real question really, and what, we've, what we're trying to do is make sure that people understand when that happens, why it happens, and what, um, uh, what the protocols are. And also, uh, getting people to understand that it doesn't happen as often as I think people believe it happens. And so, but listen, the myth, you know, the percep if the perception is there, then that becomes a reality for our officers. We, we're doing everything we can to, to dispel that, those rumors, put information out there, and give specific data around um, when that happens, what happens, and how, how quickly we get, uh, get the, the, wep the weapons back. Uh, the other thing is, I think, is, is, you know, our goal with respect to the outreach aspect of, of the work that we're doing is designed to really build some familiarity um, as the fire department has done, um, as we uh, saw has been the case in LA, and, and which is why we adopted that model, because we think it has the efficacy of that, that model really is, you know, we're all human beings, and if we have interaction, if you have a psychologist uh, and a clinician that is, becomes familiar in the, in the precinct or the PSA or the, the transit district, and you see these people on a regular basis, uh, they can provide uh, services, and you'd be much more willing to maybe pull Ben Tucker aside if you know he's available and say, hey, can I talk to you about X, Y, Z? But Matt, you want to add a little bit more? Yes, yeah, certainly. So thank you, Commissioner. So, you know, I think if we look at society in general, uh, across society, there is this stigma associated with mental health and wellness and seeking help for mental health issues. Fortunately, through all the outreach campaigns that have been going on nationally uh, and locally, that stigma is eroding, right? We see more and more people are more open to talking about mental health and wellness. That stigma does exist in the police department, and it's probably uh, even compounded in the police department because of the unique culture of policing. So human beings in general have been socialized to not acknowledge or admit to perceived weaknesses. That's very, very true in the police department as well. Uh, people who join the police department uh, have a general mindset that they're joining the police department to serve others uh, and to be the ones who provide help, not the ones who get help. So there's that built-in culture that factors against members of the service acknowledging mental health challenges and uh, being willing to uh, seek help. Uh, the police culture is one that emphasizes strength and control. Right? We're a paramilitary organization. We work because we have a hierarchical structure. Uh, we, we have a mission to serve others, and we carry out that mission. Uh, so it's antithetical to our cultural paradigm to uh, let our barrier, let our guard down and uh, acknowledge that we may have behavioral health issues ourselves and need assistance at times. Uh, certainly, there is that stigma associated with receiving help. Uh, some of that goes to uncertainty and, and distrust of health providers uh, and lack of familiarity with the health insurance systems. Uh, along those lines, we have partnered with some of the health insurance providers now to uh, conduct an outreach campaign, an information campaign to get more information out 
uh, and make sure that people are aware of the services that are available. And uh, Commissioner Tucker, you just spoke of the, a myth that persists that guns um, are taken away. And I do know that recently there was a New York Times article, um, I believe, that uh, cited that you've changed uh, your policy around uh, taking badges away. Um, and can you just speak to how many uh, guns were taken away related to mental health? Do you have a number you could give us? I don't, I don't know if we have any. I can do you get yeah, yeah, so I, I can speak to, to some of that. So, you know, let me be clear, the police department through our medical division, we do conduct assessments of members of the service who come to our attention for a variety of reasons, either because they're involved in a traumatic incident, a supervisor refers them to us, or they come to us on their own volition because they're seeking some assistance. So to be clear, we occasionally do remove firearms from members of the NYPD. Uh, we do it only when a clinician, a psychologist or psychiatrist has determined that it is necessary to save that person's life, to protect them or their family because they pose an immediate danger to themselves or others. Now, I will say that that is relatively rare. So just by example, last year, uh, our medical division dealt with or screened or interviewed over 1,300 members of the NYPD, over 1,200 of those uniform members of the service. Of those, we removed the firearms from approximately 100 pending further treatment and reevaluation. Of the 100, 84 have already gone through treatment and, and are in a position where they are able to return to duty and their firearms have been restored to them. So in most cases, it's not permanent. Uh, it's done to protect people's lives. Uh, and we do it judiciously, uh, and we do it in consultation with the healthcare provider that is providing treatment.